Interested in learning more about HPS or high pressure sodium lighting for, in regards to cannabis production? You've come to the right place here at Tobacco University where I'll be explaining some of the options with HPS lighting. So let's get into some of the options and details with HPS lighting uh, for cannabis production. So first off, we're talking about HPS lights. Uh, it is a sodium vapor lamp that is a gas discharge lamp that uses sodium in excited state to produce light, uh, a characteristic wavelength near 589 nanometers, which has that yellow-orange appearance. They are high-pressure sodium, or HPS bulbs, belong to the high-intensity discharge HID lamp family which means that they produce light in excited gases and vaporized metals with electrical current to sufficiently excite them to produce the light. Just as a note, that low-pressure sodium lamps are commonly seen as street lighting. They are not the same as these high-pressure sodium lights. High-pressure sodium lights are commonly used as plant and grow lights because of the high output that they have and ability to grow plants when we don't have the sun. Now the structure of a high pressure sodium lamp or the bulb here, as we can see, um, that there is a lot of internal structures. Now they can be purchased in 250, 400, 600, or 1000 watt setups. These are all single ended. They can also be in double ended, particularly in 1000 watts. So realize that there is a lot in here. There's a vacuum, there's a lot of metal. So when you're purchasing these lamps, be sure you inspect them to make sure that nothing is broken internally in the light. So it's safe and it will actually work. Now the distance between the high pressure sodium and the plants, high pressure sodium lights do generate quite a bit of heat. So when using higher wattages, the distance between the light and the plants should be overly, overall increased. Typical distances for high pressure sodium grow lights can be mounted anywhere between six and 34 inches away. Six inches is very close. And if you have a dimmable one or a low um, wattage output one, maybe six inches, but for the most part, it's better to start further away than, than closer. And also, when in doubt, you want to measure the light intensity with a PAR meter to start with a greater distance to reduce it if there's no burn or damage noticed. If you start too close, you'll torch potentially everything, so starting further away and bringing it closer can be advantageous. You also need to set up a ventilation system because these will be generating a fair amount of heat, even if you're only growing with one light, to be able to cool the, the environment that the plants are in. As I mentioned, that heat. So often when growing with high pressure sodium lights, growers will likely need a way to reduce the natural heat that this light source produces. A single commercial uh, reflectors are the most efficient. Uh, this will often result in growers adjusting their growing environment to either increase air circulation or adding a cooling system. This is also if some growers grow in colder climates and they're completely indoors, they may choose to run these lights at night. Why? Because they're going to generate heat anyway, uh, and when it's nighttime on the outside, in the natural environment, temperatures tend to cool, so it might be a more advantageous time to generate some heat to keep the plants warm and also provide them with light. Because if they're in an indoor facility, they're not going to know what the natural light is anyway. Now, HPS uh, replacing bulbs and the reflectors here. So a lot of growers typically think of only the bulbs, but we also have to keep in mind the reflectors. HPS grow lights should be replaced about every 5,000 to 10,000 hours of usage. The light intensity should be checked with a PAR meter. Note that the bulbs and also reflectors degrade over time. So for cannabis production, where light intensity should be maximized, growers will use the 5,000 hour mark to change out their bulbs out and not run them any longer. Uh, the reflectors, uh, you can use a PAR meter to kind of check that. Typically every about two years, keep them clean, uh, and that could be another thing. Very easy to replace, not that expensive. It can help increase the intensity of light that gets down to your plants. So those reflectors, uh, commercial all-in-one units are preferred, like the one uh, right next to me over here. Uh, over build your own options to maximize production and eliminate potential chance or incompatibilities. I also would not re recommend you taking the old um, kind of turkey tin here and flipping it over and using that as a reflector. It may look like it does the same thing, but from a plant standpoint, it's not going to be nearly as efficient as these commercial options. However, even with a quality commercial setup, reflectors should be replaced and growers are advised to purchase replacements when you're producing your light initially. To maximize production, reflectors should be checked, replaced about every two to four years to maximize the, your cannabis production there. Now, HPS lights for the entire grow cycle, can you use them from seedling stage to the end flowering stage? Well, it is possible, but usually not recommended uh, to use HPS lighting for the entire grow cycle. If this is the case, early grow plant will might stretch more evident stretching more evident, meaning your seedlings might be taller than they should be, simply because the amount of red light is great for photosynthesis, but does induce stretching of the plant. 
To reduce stretching, growers can select a bulb that produces high blue light as well, or expose plants to some natural sunlight to fill in some of the missing blue spectrum to help keep those internode spacing down a little bit. Now, high pressure sodium common wattages are about 600 and 1000 watts are the common ones. 600 watt grow lights are the most efficient HPS grow lamp. Uh, these grow lights produce more um, light output per watt used in other wattages, and their suggested coverage area is a 5x5 five five in a veg room or 4x4 four four in a flower room, definitely no more than that. For a 1000 watt, they're the most powerful and cover the largest area, 6x6 six six for a veg room and 5x5 five five for a flower room. So deciding on what wattage will also determine the type of bulb you use and the type of area you can cover. Now there's also single-ended and double-ended bulbs. So over here you can see that there's a single-ended and then below me is the double-ended. Single-ended bulbs are recommended to be used with 600 watts in, or in lower wattages. They're easy to replace and use considerably more, considerably more at the hobby level. Oh, uh, to operate and reduce temperatures, so advised for small grow tent settings uh, compared to your double ended. Your double ended are recommended for 1000 watt bulbs to ensure maximum light intensity and associated with commercial settings. They allow for greater light intensity and even more even distribution of the light compared to the single ended, and they can produce more wavelengths outside the PAR range, including infrared and UV um, light. That's why they're typically preferred at that commercial setting. Um, again, Single-ended, a little bit easier to change. Recommended for the lower wattages, commercial setting, 1,000 watts. You should be going with the double-ended because that is pretty much considered to be kind of the industry standard when it comes to high-pressure sodium lights.